with you now. Okay, so welcome to the investing webinar. You should be able to see the screen. This is what I'm going to talk about in this webinar plan process perform for portfolio success. A whole load of you have asked me about, okay, how do we do this? Hey, Stephen from Los Angeles, no less. Rakesh from Buckinghamshire, Dubai. We've got people from all parts of the world. So that's fantastic. Uh, and just let me know where you're from. We're live broadcasting this both on the webinar screen and on TikTok as well, would you believe, of all places. So get a pen and paper, get ready. One of the first things that I wanted to discuss with you, of course, what are we all feeling right now? We know what we're all feeling. We're feeling a fear of missing out. Don't get me wrong. You know, just because I'm an asset manager doesn't mean I've got inside information. Look, in the last five trading days, you should be able to see that on the screen. Listen, I'm feeling uh, uh, like, what the heck? The retail clients are better than, I might as well just give up. I might as well just stop uh, doing what I'm doing because these retail guys are better. This is in the last five trading days. And i got to say, the the... Um, actually, the only one I had in that list is not no longer in that list uh, uh, in terms of the five days was uh, French Connection. But anyway, that's a separate story. I don't own any of these. So you might think, well, you're rubbish, Alpesh. Five trading days and you haven't doubled your money. I wish I could. I wish I knew how and could double my money in such a short space of time. But that's not that's not it. So we're going to talk about, well, should we be fearful of this? But what about the risks involved? I mean, you'll have heard on social media possibly of things like Ocugen, and, you know, B Square and, and some of these uh, Outlook Therapeutics, they're going through the, I mean, these are ridiculous returns. Uh, and the volatility is to match and the risk to match. That's not, nor I mean, that's not, first of all, it's not normal. Secondly, it's not what you'd normally want, certainly in a pension. I don't want it in my pension if it's got any downside associated with that kind of volatility. So should we have a fear of missing out? That's what I'm going to address in all of this. And how do we pick more sensible, longer term picks, picks that we might want to you know, get rich slowly, where we're aware of the risks that are involved, as opposed to throwing the dice. Don't get me wrong. It can feel great throwing the dice, especially when the dice has some some of those kinds of returns. And then on the flip side, what have you got? Well, look at this, the crazy world of crypto. And the young kids are going nuts over this one, of course. Because what have you got here? I mean, again, the last five trading days, of course, I feel FOMO. I don't own any of these, by the way. Um, I, I actually know I have some ripple from God knows when. And uh, uh, pfft, that's a that's a long discussion with my mother in law. I need to have about that one. Uh, and the fault's mine, not hers. But anyway, that's a separate story. Uh, look at these. I mean, you know, this is ridiculous. And of course, people are asking, what the hell's going on? Should we be involved in any of this? I Look, it's not going to be in my pension. I had somebody I spoke to earlier and he said, look, I've put about 10K into Bitcoin for my pension. Let's see what happens or for my children. You never know. That's fine as long as you know the chance of loss could be, could be uh, uh, 100%. I don't know. You know, before you know it, some government comes in and shuts everything down. Who knows? Probably won't happen. But, you know, I don't want to talk cryptocurrencies down. But I'm just saying, I know why you're all probably thinking, what's going to happen with this crazy world of crypto? This is amazing. You know, look at these kinds of returns. We're talking 111% in Binance coin uh, in five days. IOTA, 74%. Cardona, 65%. Tron. Well, you know, that is, is that gambling? Is that volatility? So we're going to discuss that. And then just before I came on air, Bloomberg did a poll and they asked people i'd like to hear your answers as well put them in the chat box okay uh frankie i've always liked ethereum by the way uh because the underlying technology is used by it people i speak to they use it in a lot of uh blockchain but the coin and the underlying technology are completely uh, disassociated but as a coin i suspect it's going to be you know look uh as long as you know it's your risk capital that you're investing in that all right so you know, put it in the chat box. Which of these would you put it into? And of course, if you only had a thousand dollars, you probably would put it into crypto, uh, because it's only a thousand dollars, obviously. And you're thinking, well, I'll make my money later. I would if I only had a thousand. If all I, if you know, if I had a thousand dollars, you know, I'd put it into crypto. But if I'm thinking about my pension and my future and being sensible, then that might not be the case. And let's not forget. I mean, what's this showing you? That's one of those coins, uh, Binance. Coin And of course, when you see charts like that, you think, hey, how come my pension doesn't look like this? How come that's gone from 20 in July to 100? It's gone up five fold. Okay, five fold 
that'd be nice, wouldn't it? 100K would become half a million. 200,000 would become, a, you'd be a millionaire. And even if you had 1,000, hey, five grand, uh, it's not bad. But it's a crazy world. Uh, I just wanted to set up the scene. I know why a lot of people are here. They're thinking, hey, my pension doesn't perform like this. My longer term savings don't. Is it better to get rich slowly or try and throw the dice at these things? So I'm going to keep on the sensible side. I'm a regulated hedge fund manager. You'd expect me to be on the sensible side, not the gambling gaming side. My job here today on this webinar is very, very different to my regular job as a hedge fund manager. My job here today is is to tip the scales in your favor. My day job is to make rich people richer. In our fund, we have high net worths, uh, well, ultra high net worths, I should say, family offices, sovereign wealth funds, okay? People who basically write $10 million checks. That's not a very fulfilling job because you're making rich people richer. They won't mind me saying that. Uh, my job tonight is to tip the balance in your favor. I'm sort of being like, well, dare I say, Robin Hood taking from the rich and giving that knowledge and information to the regular person. Not Robin Hood, the broker, they do the opposite. They take from the regular person and give to the rich. Uh, just look at who their investors are. I have no conflict of interest with you. Let's be absolutely clear. I run a hedge fund and a private equity fund, okay? The company is domiciled out of Luxembourg. We're a British company. We own the Luxembourg funds and we're located there on Brook Street. If you know it, it's where the old US Embassy used to be. Uh, it's across the road from Claridge's. Okay, I wish I owned the whole building. I do not. Uh, we own, well, we rent one little room there. Hedrons cannot afford, even Hedrons can't afford uh, Mayfair buildings. If I could, I wouldn't be in the Hedron. I wouldn't be working for a living, would I? Okay, uh, and we have several funds. That's irrelevant to you guys because they're not open to the retail clients because you can't offer Hedrons to retail clients. You can offer the knowledge we have to retail clients, but we can't offer the funds themselves. That's the law. This is one of the reasons why people think it's all skewed against the regular bloke because they're not even allowed uh, access to, well, if I may say so myself, the elite in my industry. So uh, I've no conflict of interest with you, okay? I'm not trying to sell you a fund. I'm not a stockbroker. So I'm not trying to get you to uh, trade with my brokerage. I'm not from a Robin Hood or a Hargreaves Lansdowne or somebody. And like I said, I'm not a long only fund manager. So psh, uh, this is tipping the balance. It's actually part of my campaign to train and educate a million people in investing. And there's a website for that, campaignforamillion.com, campaignforamillion.com. But anyway, you don't care about that. Two important pieces of information as we get started on this live webinar. Okay. One, this is not financial advice because I do not know you. I do not know your personal circumstances. I do not know your risk appetites. I do not know anything about you. So it is not financial advice. I'm going to show you what I own. I'm going to show you what hedge funds own. I'm going to show you what Warren Buffett owns. I'm going to show you what Bill Gates's portfolio looks like in the course of this. I'm going to show you what Goldman Sachs have bought. Okay. None of that that I'm showing you is to say you should go away and do it because it wasn't created for you specifically. It's to educate you so you can find out for your own risk appetite what may be suitable and unsuitable, okay? Right, because for all I know, I've got a, I don't know, a 20-year-old billionaire on here and a and a 100-year-old widow with two pounds 50 to or $2.50 to rub together. So it's not financial advice. When I say my job is a tip the balance in your favor. Let me tell you specifically one thing I'm talking about. In particular is this. This is taken from my Bloomberg screen a few months ago. Uh, and look at that headline. And this really angered me. It really annoyed me. I, I was born in Armley in Leeds, okay? No silver spoon in my mouth, a regular family. My father used to deliver cars, then worked in a metal bashing factory. My grandfather was in the British Army. No, no wealth to speak of, no connections. What annoys me is when I see headlines like this, okay? UBS, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll read it out. UBS rich clients get Goldman PIMCO strategies with no extra fee. Great. UBS rich clients are colluding with Goldman's rich clients. And you probably need about 10, 20 million to have those accounts. Well, what about the rest of us? What about you guys? What about regular people? Why can't they know what everyone's saying. Why is that information private and confidential? That's not fair. And you might say, well, the Goldman's people paid lots of money for that. Um, yeah, and so? So when did knowledge become? I mean, when, when were libraries? Uh, okay, you can only, if, if, if the internet's only open to people with 10 million plus in there. I don't think that's fair. So in part of my job, because I come from a retail background, I'm probably the only hedge fund manager in the world who came from a retail background. 
part of my job has always been to get that information I see on my desk, like what you see there, and spread that knowledge and wealth. A bit like, like I said, Robin Hood. It makes me feel good, if nothing else. It makes me feel bloody amazing, actually, because the hedge fund job is, like I said, pretty unfulfilling because you're just making rich people richer. So let's just have a look at where we are in the market, and then let's look at which which stops the big banks are saying, uh, what the wealthy smart money is going into, and what the dumb money is going into, and what we may or may not want to do, and, and, and sort of educate you and teach you on how to uh, uh, become really good at uh, investing, basically. That's that's the whole point of everything that I am teaching on this. So the S&P 500, these are the US stocks over the last three months, and then we're going to look at the world, including the UK, but the whole world. What does it look like? This is what it looks like in the last three months. Okay, this has been the performance of the 500 largest American companies. Yeah, okay, nothing that would make a young person particularly excited. Microsoft up 9%, Apple 15%, Google, Tesla, hmm, 100%, you read about that in the news. Okay, and then you've got some companies in energy up 50% and so on. Our job is, how do we, out of these, find, and by the way, I better disclose some interests. Uh, you can see PayPal. I own PayPal. That's about 40% in the last three months. I own Apple. I own Microsoft. I own Alphabet, which is Google. I own Disney. I own Netflix. Well, my son owns Netflix. He's three years old. Uh, he watches enough of it. No, he doesn't. Uh, and I own some others, which I'll tell you as well. And I'll tell you what the hedge funds own, and I'll tell you what the big banks are telling their clients as well. So I give you all that information and how I came to these, right? So you get some skills in how to manage your own portfolio. That's what I want to leave you with uh, at the end of this today. I want to leave you with this sense of you can be managing your own pension, be a bit more knowledgeable at the end of this 60-minute uh, webinar, okay? So how are we going to pick out of all of this? How do we know what's already done too well, what's doing poorly, uh, what where the next thing is. Now, our job is not, our job is not to gamble on news and throw darts at this. Money is too important to try and gamble. We don't do that. We don't do that on our hedge fund. We're not going to do that when I'm teaching you guys. Okay. By the way, these are the world stocks in the past year. Sorry, a bit difficult, maybe potentially to see on screen. World stocks in the past year. OK, so what have you got? Yeah, you've got Chinese company Alibaba up 23 percent. Most people think, well, how do I buy these? Actually, you're a regular broker. You can even put this into your pension plan. OK, into your SIP, your ISA. Uh, you know, all every single one of these stocks is listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So even though it's a Chinese company like Alibaba, it's listed there. Because, I mean, don't go out and just buy it. Hey, listen, we need to know. You've got to have a strategy. You've got to know what the risks are as well. And I'm going to show you in a second the mathematics of why this get rich slowly is a lot better than let's toss it into Bitcoin. I mean, don't get me wrong. Nothing wrong with cryptos. As long as you know what you're doing, it is, you know, higher risk, higher volatility. OK, so let's talk about the sensible end. And slowly, slowly. Uh, Denise, yes, indeed. The answer is yes. OK, so let's look into that and let's work out. All right. What happens? What happens if? If we were to then drill down from a universe of not just American or not just UK, not just Chinese, not just Euro um, European, not just emerging market, the whole universe of stocks we're then looking at, guys, gets to be 9,000 stocks, 9,000 stocks. Now, that gets interesting. There's 9,000 thousand stocks all of a sudden, okay, uh, uh, that we're going to look at the universe. And why is this important that we have such a wide group? Well, this. This is the poverty gap. This is the poverty gap. The poverty gap is the difference between if you happen to be American, and so you invested probably through fund managers into the NASDAQ in the last five years. This is over the last five years, okay? And if you just were, say, you were British and you only invested in the FTSE 100, like most people's pensions would be, tracking that, okay? Well, you know what the difference is? That's minus 12, and that's up 128%. In five years, the American doubled their money. Your pension managed to lose you 12% before fees, okay? That's why I'm looking at a global universe of stocks. The more choice I have, the more likely into my squad, my football team, I'm going to get the top 15. I'll explain why 15 stocks. Because if I can choose from a universe of 9,000, then I'm more likely to find quality. It's like interviewing candidates for a job. Our portfolio, our stock portfolio is where we are interviewing 
15 of the best, best companies to manage our pension, our future, our wealth, our inheritance for our children. And those 15 companies, sure as damn it, sure as damn it better be the best in the world. Okay, so I'm not racist. I don't say I only want Chinese companies or Vietnamese companies or I only want companies from America or just from the UK. No, I want the best. The CV of those companies that we're going to analyze is their accounts. Okay, and some news, right? That's what we're going to analyze. It's like a job interview. And trust me, if you've got 9,000, you want the best talent in the world, you narrow it down to 15, you're going to get the best of the best of the best, aren't you? Okay, that's why I don't like fund managers, because what fund managers do is they'll pick a narrow group only from one country, UK, US, or wherever. Okay, and then they'll turn around and say to you, uh, okay, from there, we've got to just, uh, we've got so much capital, we can, we've got to spread it really widely. Whereas you and I don't need all of that nonsense. We're going to pick it for us. The other problem we've got to overcome, not just the poverty gap of why your portfolio, your pension probably stinks, or you've not even started because you're thinking to yourself, where do I even begin, Alpesh? And that's what this webinar is about, is to make sure you've got the ability to begin. Okay, Frankie, I'll answer your question in a bit. Uh, everyone, I'll answer your questions as we go along. I've just got a lot of material I want to cover. Okay, so bear with me. Feel free to keep posting the questions, though. Keep asking the questions. I will answer them as we go along. And by the way, most of you think on the poll, 75% of you think we're going to be up by in the US by the end of 2021. I think you're right. I think you're right. Okay, I think you're right. Uh, I'll ask the same question uh, regarding the UK markets, and I'll share the results of that poll shortly in a second as well. So we want to avoid that problem. The other problem we've got is this. This is a typical bad portfolio of one of my students. Okay, one of my students, I asked him to send in their portfolio before I analyze it and look at it. And this was a typical portfolio. He And I said, what the hell are you doing? Why is this in your pension? And he said, well, name recognition. I recognize names like that, Alpesh. I recognize Aviva, BA Systems, Barrett, BP. And I said, well, yeah, I understand that. But what the hell? Your portfolio in three months alone is down 37%? Yeah, let's talk about risk. Yeah, people say, oh, well, you know, investing is risky. It is if you don't know what you're doing and you go by name recognition. That's like me saying, oh, I hired somebody uh, in my firm because his name was, uh, um, I don't know, John Wayne. And John Wayne's a famous name. I mean, what the hell? Oh, did you look at his CV, i.e. his accounts? No. Did you ask for references, i.e. his track record, track record of that company to deliver results and perform? No, I just went by the name. Uh, you know, I heard John Wayne did good movies. So this other guy, um, he's, he's short, bit fat, but uh, his name's John Wayne. That's how most people pick their stocks. Seriously, it's how they do it. And then they wonder as the years go by. Many of you on this might be in your 20s, never mind 30s, 40s, 50s. And you think, oh, it's too complicated. I'll leave it. We're going to simplify it. We're going to simplify it because guess what? Computers make it easier. We're going to know what to look for, why it's important. And then we're just going to get the names. And we're going to hold 15 stocks for 12 months. OK, and I'll tell you why Goldman Sachs says, according to their research, plus a lot of other research, those are the right numbers. I'll share that with you as well in this. They're not my numbers just off plucked out of the air. They're numbers based on that. OK, so if you want to learn about finance, you want to sort of know. And I had a, a lady who was about 50. No, she was about 60, actually. Or 55, I forget which. And she said, you know, my pension's not done very well. You know, what's going on? I said, well, let's have a look at it. And I said, look, first thing, educate yourself. Yes, there's risk to investing. Look at that. If you pick the wrong bloody things, even big name companies drop like that. OK, so what have I got? Uh, I'll just let you know what I've got. And then we'll go into how do you analyze things so you're knowledgeable, you're informed. This is an educational webinar, which hopefully will turn some of you young people into millionaires in the years to come and turn your pensions, or at least you'll know what to ask about your pensions uh, uh, around as we go forward. All right. This happens to be some of what's in my portfolio. Okay. And in my son's, my son's three years old. All right. I've got tech target. Um, I will explain why I use three times leverage on the S&P 500 index. Yes, I've still got Apple, Amazon, how boring am I? Square, uh, yes, PayPal. Why do I have two times leveraged oil? Well, it was bought last uh, March or February when oil was at a low price. And I expect to make 100% return on that at some point. And I've got a bunch of others. And why have I got two times leverage Microsoft, which means each time Microsoft goes up a dollar, I make $2. Why have I done that? I'm going to explain all of this to you. And you can see, how come my portfolio in the last few months, and this is, I don't know, last nine months or something, looks a hell of a lot better than this guy, 
okay, who's down 37% in three months, and I'm up this much in the last three months over the same period. What the hell's going on, okay? And by the way, just as an aside, I happen to be chairman of the Lumbar Foundation uh, alongside Lord uh, Karambila Moria, who you might have heard of because he's chairman of the Confederation of British Industry. Uh, we're both co-chairs of it. We look after widows and orphans. When you make money from the education I'm going to give you, please remember uh, the most fulfilling thing will be to donate to some greater cause than yourself. doesn't have to be this one. I just mentioned what I'm chairman of. You might give to UNICEF. Once you've secured your family's future, your family's future. I'm a teetotal vegetarian. I don't need much money. Um, I don't party. I don't eat expensive steaks and I don't drink. So, you know, uh, but you might have more expensive lifestyle. But anyway, I say that. Forgive me for, you know, sort of patronizing you and being condescending. I apologize for that. Please also, all of you, make sure you're connected with me on LinkedIn. OK, uh, you'll be able to see what we do at uh, my firm, what I do with the government as well and um, all my investment stuff. That's an aside. So what I'm going to give you in this webinar is uh, let's solve those problems. How do we know what picks, what stocks to pick? OK, as well. Um, and I'm going to give some of the information that uh, this book isn't published yet. It's not out yet. Financial Times haven't uh, published it yet because I haven't sent them the full manuscript yet. Uh, OK, so I'm going to do this and I'm going to explain leverage as we go forward and the risks Risks, risk, risk to everything. I'm going to explain everything that uh, Benjamin, Lindsay, and Murray are asking. Uh, hold your horses. Hold your horses there. Okay. And I'm going to give you not just the information I've got from my experience as a hedge fund manager, not just what's been published by the Financial Times that I've written uh, in my various columns and everything else, but also just from my years of experience. I don't always hang out with the former governor. Well, he was governor of the Bank of England at that time uh, and all the rest of it, but I'll share all that with you. Okay. And I'm going to give you in this webinar all the information that I've had published in my books. Don't buy the books, okay? I'm gonna give you all the best bits in this webinar. It's all been condensed because everybody does, nobody reads anymore, everybody does uh, videos, okay? And just so you know, it's not just, uh, oh, you, where did you come from? I've been doing this for 20 odd years, all right? Uh, uh, and educating people. I had my own show on Bloomberg, I was doing it, and that's Sally, by the way, and that's still Sally, uh, then on the BBC. All right, so just so you know, there is a track record on longevity to all of this. So let's, let's go into what part of my job is. Part of my job, yeah, it's to know. This was back in around April time, and the S&P can reach a record in the first half of 2021. Part of my job is to know who's saying uh, what, all right? And the S&P has indeed reached that. So my job is to see which way the mood music is and my holdings to know whether or not the holdings are right or they're wrong for me. OK, it's as simple as that. Uh, so I'm going to share some of that with you as well. What we're hearing now, though, OK, Goldman has raised its downside target, the US stocks post rally, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, and they've moved it up, basically. Well, guess what? It was up here is where we are uh, uh, now. So. When they moved their downside target up, that told us all, look, everybody's bullish. Everyone's pointing in the same direction. It shouldn't come as a surprise to me when these things happen. All right. My job is also to share this information with you, which I will, uh, JP Morgan stuff, anybody's stuff, basically. All right. And in this webinar, it's also to share and ride the coattails of what the big money's doing. Right. This was something which Goldman Sachs had written recently about the very what they call their very important positions for hedge funds. So what they do is obviously they see a lot of hedge fund traffic. OK, they see because a lot of hedge funds trade through Goldman Sachs as their broker, just like Robin Hood might be your broker. Goldman Sachs um, is a broker to hedge funds. So guess who's got more valuable data? Yeah, they Robin um, Robin Hood hasn't uh, Goldman Sachs. Has. So what happens? These are some of the big names. Now, I don't just buy them because it's on here. All right, by any means, just because it's on there. This is the Goldman VIP basket, and it it's basically outperformed the S and P five hundred and sixty one percent of the quarter since two thousand and one. In other words, it is likely to do better than the market. It examines the holdings of eight hundred twenty two hedge funds, representing one point eight trillion dollars. Okay, now what were the names? Just because these names are here doesn't mean I buy them. So how do we look at this? Because we're going to hear a lot of stuff in the news. And um, we're going to hear, uh, 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 and we're going to be reading magazines. And that's not a good process. I got friends who message me, and they say, Arpesh, you know what, I'm fed up of picking my pension based on an uncle sending a WhatsApp, or something I read in the newspapers, or chasing this story, or chasing that. How do I know when to buy, when to sell? Okay, we take all of this information in, but we need to know what to do with it and how to use it. Okay, so how are we going to do that? And by the way, we also, yes, sure, we look at the highest buy ratings in the S&P 500. Okay, this is 
the highest percentage of buy ratings by banks and analysts. So which are the which are the stocks they're telling all their rich clients? Okay, which are the biggest banks telling all their rich clients these are their most popular favored ones? And out of this list, I own Amazon, I own Alphabet, I don't own the others. Why not? Alphabet, what's wrong with you? Uh, and this is the list, by the way. Oh, by the way, you should have a phone and take photos of this. You know, take screenshots because I might be moving along a little bit quickly. These are the worst. These are the biggest sells. So these might be the ones which, I don't know, some silly hedge fund might want to short, but not me. We don't uh, do that with, well, news calls in there. My point is, uh, Shimmel, no, you'll have to take photos, I'm afraid. Uh, okay, intellectual property protection. It's some of the stuff is proprietary and confidential to my hedge fund. I can't just give you the slides. Uh, take photos with your camera phone, okay, on this. Now, the highest percentage of sell ratings in the S&P 500. By the way, you should have a phone, you know, uh, somebody once complained that, oh, I didn't have time, but you moved too quickly. Okay, pretend this is my phone. I take it, I take a picture. Cha -cha. There you go, that's ample time for you to do it. Grab a pen and paper if you wish, but a phone will be the best thing. So. Where does all this information go? How do we use all of this? There's so much bloody noise. And what's our big picture job anyway? My big picture job, look, that's Amazon at the top. You can't quite read it, sorry. That's Amazon at the top, that's Apple. This is since 2004. This is when I set up the hedge fund in 2004, and that's 2004 there with Apple. We had two major holdings at that time, which happened to be Amazon, Apple, and RIN, which was BlackBerry, okay? Excuse me while I drink some coffee. I'm going to need the caffeine. Um, we don't just buy and hold forever. This whole notion, and people go to you, hey, if you bought Bitcoin 10 years ago, if you bought Amazon 10 years ago, if you bought Apple 10 years ago, nobody buys and holds forever. The world changes too quickly, let alone which. Look at the periods in which it just goes sideways and does bloody nothing. What an idiot would have held that for three years when it goes sideways. So, yes. I currently hold Amazon and Apple. Doesn't mean I'll hold it forever. Look at those periods where it does nothing or then it just went down. Why would I do that? Why would I, what, what, I, I'm sadomasochistic with my investments? I think not, okay? So what we also need to know is, well, if we're not gonna hold things forever, how long are we gonna hold them? How do we know not just when to buy, but when to sell, okay? Without overburdening ourselves. Let me turn to the big picture for a second. Okay, the big picture is how much money what might we make? That's the big picture. That's the picture everybody's interested in. How much money what might we make? What are, what are our goals? So let's look at slightly longer term. If you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, this is great. Okay, even in 60s. Assume you plan to invest over 10 years. And with my help, the education I'm going to give you, you get 20% per annum. Some years you'll get more, some years you'll get less. Listen, in 2008, I didn't get 20%. Of course I didn't. Some years I get more, some years I get less. I actually target 40% with my skill experience and because I look at US stocks uh, and global stocks. If it was only UK, I'm targeting 20%. If it's US, I'm targeting 40%. Uh, and you saw some of the returns and you can see why. Okay, I have 15 stocks. I'm targeting that return. Not every one of them will do that. Some will do 100%, some will do 0%. The 15 at the end of 12 months will have averaged out, okay? If I knew which one was always gonna do 100%, guess what, I would have put all my money in that. That's why we don't put all our eggs in one basket. Equally, I don't spread it so thinly that were I to find a good stock, my money spread too thinly, I don't get a return. But I'll come to those numbers in a second. Don't worry, grab a pen and paper, I'll come to those numbers. Let's say you've got 100K. Now, most of you won't have that. You'll have 10K, I'll give you the 10K example. Okay, in a second. But let's say you've got 100K in your pension. You might have a million, you might have 10 million. But so just pro rata this up, whether it's in your 401K, your SIP, or your ISA. Let's say you plan to add one and a half thousand each month or in one lump sum at the end of the year, because this is the wealthy example. I will give you, I will give you the poorer 10K example in a second, right? Well, on this math, you will have a million at the end of 10 years. Now, some of you will say, I don't want to turn 100K into a million in 10 years. I want to turn it into a million in two minutes. I see on TikTok, there's some kid who keeps saying every day he makes a million or a hundred thousand or half a million. Um, he still looks like he lives with his mom and dad, but that's besides the point in a basement closet. Uh, but, uh, I want to make that. I see the Ferraris. Okay, fine. Let's just, let's just talk about proper wealth for a second. Let's talk about get rich slowly. Okay. That's what would happen with those numbers. And this is how it works. The blue line is your contributions over 10 years. The red line is the returns. That's my job for my family. Actually, it's more than that because I want to get 40% per annum. That's our job. It's not 20, but okay. So there you get the idea. All right. That's the job. We're trying to turn 100 into a million. Okay. There's some contributions added to that over 10 years. 
right? Now that's boring for some, but uh, when it's 40%, guess what? Happens a hell of a lot sooner. Happens a hell of a lot sooner. Let's say you start off with 10K. You might borrow it from your parents, or you might be just in your 30s. You might be starting uh, late. Could be anything, right? Or pro rata this up. If you've got 50, just multiply everything by five. And you plan to add 6K a year or 500 a month, whichever way you want to look at it. Then this is what your returns would look like if it was 20% per annum. In actual fact, this is what my son's ISA, because in an ISA, you can only put 10K a year in, or it used to be four. Was it four? Yeah, it was four. Now it's just under 10. Okay, and he's three years old. He's got his birthday in a couple of weeks, right? So when he was born, we were there. By the time he is 16, I want the little spoiled bugger to have about half a million dollars. All right, now you might say, well, that's, you're a bit not very generous. We're only doing it 10K. Okay, we're doing a quite a small amount, right? Um, in actual fact, he's doing better than 20% per annum because when he was born, since he was born, the markets have rallied. Okay, so anyway, that's besides the point. So let's break this down into two very uh, simple parts. The problems to investing and the solutions I'm going to give you and some of the stocks that Goldman's are talking about, how you can do it yourself. So I'm not just going to give you some fish. I'm going to teach you how to fish. Okay, and as a hedge manager, this is what I teach my staff as well, right? And it's what I've taught around the world, and it's what's in all my Financial Times published books, my 200 Financial Times columns on my Bloomberg TV show and all the rest of it. So I've got credentials in terms of what I'm teaching you. So let's look at problem number one, the blasted problem of too much information. Okay, too much information. Major, major problem, too much information. Right, so how are we going to solve that? Uh, because what this leads to is then people start just giving their money to experts and paying fund managers. Don't do that. I want to show you, you can get on top of it. And even as a non-expert, just as I can teach you how to drive a car, I can teach you how to invest. Do you trust me to teach you how to drive a car? Yeah. Okay. I can teach you how to invest. Right. And a big problem with, with, with trying to pick stocks and invest is, is this. Look, it's too complicated. Valuations. Are we going to measure? Price to earnings, what the hell is that anyway? Okay, price earnings growth ratio, price to book value, price to sales, discount cash flow, DCF. Uh, 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 but we do know undervalued companies, because the research proves it, undervalued companies are better than overvalued ones. But there are exceptions. Look at Tesla, overvalued but still growing. So we know it's a factor we should look at, but we don't know which one. And we don't know which one's important and how important it is. And what about growth? Okay. Oh my God. Some journalist will write about sales growth, but he won't have talked about valuation. So we think, do we, do we follow him or not? Okay. And is it sales growth or profit growth or cash flow growth? There's lots of different types of growth when you say a growing company, but we also know a growing company is better than a non growing company, obviously. But what if the growing company is overvalued and it could fall off a cliff? So we know we can't just look at valuation alone or growth alone. So. If we know we've got to look at multiple factors, what are the others? And this is already sounding like you need a PhD and I'll just give it to somebody else, Alpesh. Okay. Um, no, <laughs> thanks, Paresh. ISA allowance is 20K. Um, the junior ISA, what am I getting mixed up with? I'm getting mixed up with something. ISA is 20K, you're right. Junior ISA, something is only 4K. I think it's the junior ISA. I forget which. Something was 4K and now it's 9,800. I think it's the junior ISA I meant, Paresh. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, okay. Valuation, growth, and then there's income. If the company pays dividends, we know companies paying dividends do better than companies which don't, with exceptions. So we know it's one factor. So how are we going to weigh all this? And we know momentum. I mean, bloody hell, momentum. Whoa. Look at, I don't know, GameStop. A company which is overvalued with no growth, no dividends, and yet purely on momentum makes you sit ridiculously rich. Okay. Okay. Uh, makes you ridiculously rich. Okay. Income, momentum, right? Momentum. So which of these are we going to look at? That's too complicated. Nobody's got the time to do this. You've all got better things to do than be doing this. So I'm going to show you how we're going to shortcut it, how we're going to hack it. How are we going to investment hack it, let alone statistics? What if the company's really volatile? What if it, you pick two stocks and they all move in tandem with each other? Then you've not diversified. Then you could be in trouble anyway. Again, you then make the mistake of, oh, I'll just give it to a fund manager. And that's what fund managers want you to do. They want it to sound complicated because they can earn big fat fees. The worst thing is it'd be fine if you gave it to them and they did something which you could have done but saved you the time and the education. The problem is they don't do that. What they do is they F up your portfolio. They underperform. They track an index because they've got too much capital. And so they divide it into the tiny little sub pots and tiny little companies. Okay. So you end up not with a good portfolio suitable to you, but you end up with a whole, basically a really bad one. Okay. 
uh, as well. Uh, so what's the secret? Well, if there was a secret, and I'm going to show you some Goldman Sachs slides in a moment and some JP Morgan and UBS ones, companies which fall the least in down markets, that's the secret. We want companies which in down markets fall the least and rebound the most in rising markets. How are we going to find that? Because we're going to look at all this other data you saw. Okay, we're going to look at all of that, but we're going to look at that with a view to making sure we've got resilient stocks. Why do we want resilient companies? Resilient companies are, by definition, the ones which fall the least in down markets, rise in rising markets. Why do we want that? Because in a rising market, everybody's a bloody genius. In a falling market, in a falling market, it's all about how much money do you keep? Not how much you made in a rising market. How much did you actually keep? Okay. The rich people, they're not the ones who made their money when the markets were rising. Everybody made their money when they were rising. The rich people are the ones who get to keep it when the markets are falling and everyone's losing theirs. That's the difference. Okay. Everyone's a genius in a rising market. It's not how much you make. It's how much you get to keep. Companies which fit the above profile, probably about 10% of all companies. It's actually less than that. It's about... 250 companies out of 9,000. Uh, somebody do the maths for me on that. Okay, it's about 2.5%, uh, right? Which fit that profile, 2.5%. And they tend to be the ones strong on profit growth, dividends, cash flow, sales growth, fair valuation, outperformance. Well, that sounds like a lot of jargon. How the hell are we going to hack that? So how are we going to do the shortcut to that? Jazz, I'll answer that question about penny stocks. Uh, in a second. Well, essentially, all we're trying to do is what the super rich do, okay, what Goldman Sachs' Sustain does, which is part of their Goldman Sachs uh, Investment Research Unit, okay? All they're trying to do is find companies with return on capital, with management quality, and industry positioning. That's a jargon way of saying everything that I've already just said, valuation, growth, income, cash flow, companies which won't fall too far when they fall and will rise when the rest of the market rise. And these guys have been around for over 100 years. You know, trends come and go, Bitcoins come and go, Teslas come and go. These guys still keep making money. So we're gonna look at a bit of, we're gonna cheat and steal some of their ideas. We're gonna steal ideas from a lot of people. Okay, we're also gonna steal some of the ideas from the Financial Times columns, from this clever chap. Oh, it's me, sorry. Uh, okay, do the right sum. I mean, I've written about everything I'm telling you, I've written about it in my columns and everything I've done has been monitored and verified by a Financial Times award-winning software company who monitors mine since 2004, which is when I started giving my picks to them. Uh, and they've been doing it, and there you can see the returns. <laughs> okay, from next to nothing, from 10K to half a million uh, on a UK portfolio, which I then expect to go up at 20% per annum. All right? Um, but we're worried. What are we going to bloody pick now when bubble is so much in the news? And... Yes, Arpesh, I understand you said value and momentum, but how the heck would you expect us to do this? You're going to teach us to drive in an hour, okay? Essentially, you're going to teach us how to fish in and out value, momentum, ownership. This is what we do. We score it. I'm going to show you how to do it this way because it's a lot quicker. Value, momentum, ownership, quality, whatever factors we're going to look at, value, growth, income. We'll have the stock names and we're going to score them because that is the quickest way to get those picks. You're going to hold them for 12 months, 15 stocks, okay? Got it? I'm going to break this down for you. Don't worry. I'm going to break it down to make it so simple. There's a rich-poor divide, as I already said. So I'm going to give you that information. Remember at the start, I told you UBS rich clients get Goldman strategies with extra fees. I'm going to give you the Goldman strategies. Don't tell UBS. Don't tell Goldman's our little secret. Uh, and I'm going to show you their slides because I stole it from them. Very naughty. Okay. Why do I say 15 stocks? This is why. This is your portfolio risk or volatility. This is... This is the number of shares. As you increase the number of shares beyond about 15, actually, the, you're not removing risk that much. You might say, no, Alpesh, it should be 25. Between 15 and 25, okay, it's one of those. No, absolutely, Parash. Tesla, great. Um, let me know if you find any other Teslas. Uh, I'd love to have one. That kind of volatility is not for me. Congratulations to everybody who believed in it all the way through. You deserve it. Uh, all the rich pickings you've got. Um, and, and let me know about all the other ones that you find out there. Um, or maybe your pension is just purely 100% in Tesla, in which case, wow, uh, for that kind of risk, well, for that kind of luck, go play the lottery as well while you're at it. But I'm talking about things which are replicable. I'm talking about things which people can do over and over again, right? 
So I'm going to say about 15 to 25 stocks is the max you want, right? Now, how long should you hold? Let's solve that problem. We're going to, we're going to go into which stocks I like in a second. Either stocks go up in your portfolio or they go down. If they go up, I have quality stocks, which I'll review in 12 months. Which are my quality stocks? I have five companies, which I think are quality, which will protect me no matter what. If the world comes to an end, uh, people are going to fly into these companies and if the world doesn't come to an end, these companies are going to keep growing. Okay. And then I've got my other performance stocks, which I'll also review in 12 months. If the market's gone up, I'll just review them in 12 months. I don't panic each day and go, what's what's happening in my portfolio? What's happening? What's happening? I've got better things to do. Okay. I've got roses to smell. I've got blue skies to see. All right. And if the market falls, well, if they're quality stocks, I just hold. Might even buy some more. And I'll tell you which of those five in a second. And if they're my performance stocks, well, if they drop 25% from the peaks since I bought them, so maybe they went up 100%, then dropped 25%, so they went up 75%, I'd exit. Or 12 months are up, whichever. Okay, that's the rules. Take a picture of that if you wish on that. Okay, part of what else we do is we might do some tactical shifts. Like I might increase my confidence. When I get a report like this uh, in March of last year, and you can look at what the market did after this report. After this report, the market was going like this. After this report, it went like this, okay? This report came out March 26th. That's when the market hit the bottom. Part of me might build up my confidence, but I'm not timing it based on these reports. Now, listen to that carefully. I do not gamble on news or banking reports or analysis, okay? What we do in my industry, the hedge fund industry, is we don't gamble, contrary to what you might think. Some idiots do. They go bust, Right, Melville Capital gambled. They went bust. They go bankrupt very quickly. Those kind of people who gamble, they're idiots. Okay, they were idiots at that hedge fund, absolute idiots, uh, and that's why they lost. Okay, my job is tactically within my overall strategy, value, growth, income, cash flow, is to say, oh, I see this report. Okay, I'm I'm more confident in my holdings. Let's say this didn't come out. I'm still holding my holdings. I know it'll take longer uh, for me to get my returns. Okay, problem number four. Your fund manager, the person you're trusting or your parents are trusting or whoever, that's a real problem, okay? Um, uh, uh, it's a real problem. Your IFA fund manager is handcuffed. You're get, going to be poor. Why? Well, this is a typical fund. This is a 91 UK listed equity growth. It could have been US listed equity growth. It's got growth in the title. It's got the letter A. It's got five diamonds. It's got a number eight out of 10. It says investment booster. Over three years, it must have done incredibly. Oh, it's done minus. 2%, minus 2%, you might not be able to see the screen clearly, it's done minus 2%, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? No wonder I bloody hate fund managers, okay? And I'm not a long-only fund manager. There's the elite, <laughs> uh, 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 and then there's the long-only fund managers like these idiots, uh, okay? And even worse, if you're lucky, you get a poor return and you're meant to be grateful. I'll tell you why. This is what that fund is said in its documents. Now, let's say you're with... Um, I don't know, an employer's pension plan. That's great. You should all have a pension. We should all have a pension because it's tax-free growth. Um, money comes in. Our employer puts some in. The government doesn't tax it. Uh, it grows without tax being removed from it, so it grows more. The only problem is, who have they given that money to? Which fund manager? If they've given it to this numpty, well, what this numpty is saying, and it's a regular mainstream fund, is what you might get back after costs. This is what they expect, right? They expect you're going to get a 5% return. Jeez, and you're supposed to fall at their feet for that? The fund manager has said, return each year, average 5%. That was equity growth. Are you kidding me? I'm talking even Microsoft, probably the safest company I can think of. I'm not talking Tesla. I'm not talking, uh, 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 um, I don't know, cryptos. I'm talking even Microsoft can do better than this. Yeah, because actually it generates me 40% in a year. Jeez. 5%? That's what's happening. So people say to me on various platforms, hey, Alpesh, um, but what's wrong with pensions? Nothing wrong with pensions. No, there's nothing wrong with pensions. It's where the money is put, which manager is the pension fund provider putting it with. Do you understand? When you put money into your pension, it doesn't magically grow because some tooth fairy decided to give you free money. It grows because some fund manager has been given it to grow it, but they don't. They take out fees, they underperform, and you're left with 5% per annum. And guess what? They're driving around in a freaking Ferrari, right? So that's why I want you to at least, I don't expect you all to be your own fund managers. I expect you to at least look into your own pension and find out what the hell they're charging you. This is a document from them, okay? And so what did that person buy in the growth? 
or your IFA, especially if you're self-employed. I want you to listen to this. If you're self-employed, you've got a bigger problem than most people because you're having to manage it yourself, okay? So listen to me carefully. These are the top 10 holdings. This was one of my students. He sent me this and said, look, I've invested in this. He was a, uh, a, a surgeon. Okay, he's in his 40s. And he said, he said, oh, Steve, yes, qu uh, quality and performance, I'll tell you, because I own both. I'll tell you quality in a second. Give me a second, Steve. Okay, this is what he owned. So this fund manager owned 48 stocks. Why? Why? Okay. Uh, and his top holdings, right? So basically, after his top 10th holding, everything was under 3%. So what was the point of it anyway, other than kickbacks, other than kickbacks, okay, other than kickbacks uh, from brokers? BP before the oil price crash? Shell before the oil price crash? Well done, chap. Okay, nearly 10% in oil before the oil price crash. And he thought UK growth means American, British American tobacco? Tobacco? What, because the world's smoking more? I don't get that. If anything, we know it's smoking less. Anyway, so he did this, and no wonder he got minus 2%, and it gets worse. This is what they tell you. If you invest $10,000, it's the same if you're American, $10,000. Total cost, if you cash in after five years, their recommended holding period. These are their figures, their recommended holding period. A 1,000 pounds in cost, 10%. People come to go, no, I'll pay sure. I, I thought it's like half a percent. I thought, I thought the charges are only half a percent. No, they're not telling you the total cost of ownership. The total cost, the to ask them the total fripping. Tell them to give you this document, which they won't give you. This was on page 45, by the way, of my students for, uh, uh, when he sent this to me, because I told him and I showed him and he was shocked. And he was self-employed as a surgeon, he's self-employed. And he said, whoa, okay. So uh, you can be better than a fund manager. And you wanna know why? This is me, 2004 winning the competition in the Financial Times. I'm not here to brag. Thanks very much. I get enough pats on the back. But if you want to give me some follows and likes, uh, I love that. Okay, that's Neil Woodford. That was in 2004. I trounced him. I came top, okay, in a competition to forecast the markets over a 12-month period. Wood, and I was a retail client in 2004. I hadn't set up the hedge fund then. I was a retail client. I used this publicity to set up the hedge fund. Woodford got found out, okay, uh, got found out 12 years later, uh, 13 years later, by the time he had amassed 9.2 billion pounds and he had to apologize that he got caught. Well, I embarrassed him in 2004, but nobody listened because all the marketing jargon, oh yeah, Neil with his hot hand, he's great. For God's sake, it was in the financial bloody times. A private investor, a retail client, i.e. me, humiliated and embarrassed him. But no, no. Do people read the FT? No, of course not. Why should they? It costs a whole pound. He narrowly beat Jasper the bloody cat. The editor's cat he, the, uh, uh, did a stock pick based on some random numbers. Okay? He, he, he smiles like a cat. Yeah, so that's who you're giving your money to. And if you think I'm just, oh, well, you're Johnny come lately, Mr. Patel. No, that was my very first column in the Financial Times in 1999. You can see what I set up a hedge fund with that kind of following and publicity. Of course, you're going you're gonna to get investors. So we got institutional investors. And you see what I said? Yes, and what's more, they should probably sell up their entire UK holdings and buy only US stocks. And I'm not here just to say, oh, buy American, you'll be fine. No, we've got to still pick particular stocks. And actually this year, I think it's a good year to tactically have some uh, UK companies as well as US. Now, 75% of you on here will be from the United Kingdom. I'm a proud British patriot. I want you to have Americans working for you and bring back the profits you make from the companies that you've invested in back to the UK and spend it locally, okay? And if you're American, you're so lucky. All right. Uh, that's, that's me. 1999. So for 21 years, this is not Johnny come lately. You've just woken up to this. Okay. So like I said, the other problem was one of when to sell. I've said this. So what are my quality stocks? I have five which are quality and the rest are performance in my 15. The five quality for me are the ones which will be flight to quality. They'll be very resilient as will all my others, but they're ones which if they fall, I don't care. I'm not going to sell them. I don't have the 25% rule with these. Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, uh, uh, Apple, uh, and Microsoft. Okay, it's those. Now, why do I say 12 months? Because Goldman Sachs say that the holding period uh, has shortened since the 1940s to the 2010s, okay, to 12 months for most funds, and they review. So if they're reviewing after 12 months, we better review after 12 months. Complicated chart, stolen from them. It's based on their research. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that, okay? Remember these numbers, 12, 15, 25. 12 months, 15 stocks, 25% drop from the highs, okay? It's to keep it simple. You might say, oh, but I wanna make it more complicated. Don't, 
You might be excited today to make it complicated. Tomorrow, you won't be excited, and then you won't do it. So what are the solutions, and which stocks do I like? Part two, solutions. Give me 10 more minutes. It's all I need of your time. This is the best bit, the important bit, right? I have six strategies you can copy, okay? Not one of these strategies would I pick a stock on unless, unless, these are idea generation strategies, unless it's value, growth, income, cash flow, and the other factors I'm going to tell you in a second, low volatility, high consistent performance, i.e. momentum. Write that down if you wish. Value, growth, income, cash flow, momentum, okay, consistent performance, low volatility, right? I'll mention it again. So what's strategy one? Guru buys. What are the big funds going into? What are the big rich people going into? That does not mean I buy it. Most people do it exactly the wrong way. Thank you very much, Jazz, my friend. They do it the wrong way. Okay, Parish, I'm glad you found one. You found one for now. You could just replicate it. Okay, if you found a fund manager you like, just find out what their top 10 holdings are. Sack the fund manager, buy those yourself, or keep a thousand pounds with that fund manager so you get the documents and see what their top 10 holdings are. Buy them yourself, save on the fees. I just saved you a fortune. And over 10 years, that might, that amounts to a lot of fees you'll have saved. That's how you cheat the fund managers. If you think you've really got a good one, find out what their top holdings are. They've got to tell you by law. OK, and then copy them. But I'm not even saying you do that. I say you do it yourself. Now, just because these guys, billionaires, this is what their portfolios are worth. OK, you've heard of Bill Gates. You've probably not heard of the others. You might have heard of Soros. You've heard of Warren Buffett. Just because you've heard of them doesn't mean that you just buy them. Like I said, unless these stocks also meet my value, growth, income, cash flow, I won't buy them. So you can take a picture if you wish of this. OK, feel free. Uh, I'll let you take a picture of it if you wish. Five, four, three, two, one. Ample time to take a picture. There's another. Right. So just because he owns Apple, Buffett owns Apple, doesn't mean I'm going to buy into it. Just because Bill Gates owns Berkshire or whatever, or any of these. And by the way, out of these, what do I own? Yes, I do own Apple. I own Fiserv. OK, um, I own Alphabet, which is Google. All right. I own Amazon, which is there. Um, I'll come to the others that I own. Just because they own it doesn't mean I'll own it. And I'll come to what some of these are uh, in a second, okay? I will also look at, in strategy one, in strategy one, I will also look at this. They post their holdings with the regulators. Um, so if you go to the SEC, uh, you'll find it there. I'll also look at the hedge fund ownerships, okay? And these are the securities hedge funds in aggregate and adding. Doesn't mean I go and buy it. That doesn't give a process. That doesn't give something where I can smell the roses and play with my kid. Okay, what I've got to do, what I've still got to do is look at which ones have dropped and make sure I don't have any in that list, which usually I don't, uh, and which ones have I got over here. Okay, so let's just zoom into that. And they've still got to have value, growth, income, cash flow, right? And I've still got to review it every 12 months. Now, most of these I don't happen to have. Etsy, I own, okay? Uh, T. Rowe Price, I own. Um, but, but, but I don't have Moderna or, and you might think I'm stupid not owning some of the others. Well, fine, let me be stupid. There's only 15 I can own anyway. Okay, take a picture of that. I'll count to five, gives you ample time to take a picture. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so what's Warren Buffett's latest trades? Of course, my team will give me this and tell me what he's buying and what he's selling. But just because he's bought it doesn't mean I'll go and do it. It still has to be value, growth, income, cash flow. Do you understand now? Do you understand why and how it works? Just because I know that he's buying these, of course, it's important, relevant information, but I need to know what's the size he's added and by how much. But that in itself is not a reason to buy ever, ever. So what happens if we aggregated all those gurus? Well, for the S&P, this is what it would come to. OK, this is what the numbers would come to. And that, by the way, dark green means the most popular amongst all the gurus in aggregate. So Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, everybody else. That's United Healthcare. Hasn't risen much. OK, because their risk reward portfolio isn't as aggressive as anybody else's. Amazon, I have two times leverage on that because I know it's a relatively safe company. It's one of my quality companies. So I do two times leverage on that. OK, so there's a whole bunch of others. Which ones don't I have? I don't have this. This is where the TikTok army will play. If you're a TikToker and you want to gamble on the markets doubling up, that's where you want to play. You won't find much play up here. In fact, you won't even dare go near it. Okay. The Reddit army, they'll probably want to play. They won't even play down there. They'll play, right? They'll stay from the ones which are away from the really big boys. Okay. So the hedge fund they took down wasn't a big boy. All right. It was uh, hardly anything. Um, Investing strategy number two, I leverage big on low risk. What do I mean? What I just said. 
Okay, I will have leverage on two times Amazon. I've got two times Microsoft. I've got two times PayPal. Okay, just so you know, and I've got three times uh, S&P. Now, leverage is not genius. Leverage is more risk. Okay, and I'll tell you, there's two types of risk with leverage. If something goes down a dollar, I lose two dollars. That's risk number one. The other risk with leverage is the way mathematics works is if the if the product like Microsoft goes up and down, up and down, up and down, starts at 100, keeps going up and down, and ends at 100, the leverage version will actually not be at the same price you bought it. It'll be lower. It's just how maths works with leverage, okay? You can do it on a piece of paper tonight, and you'll see that that's what happens, right? So that's some of my uh, uh, positions which I'd leverage in, as long as they meet my value, growth, income, okay? Uh, what banks, what ba uh, my uh, kid, my, my team, it's their job to give it to me, okay? Uh, Frankie, you can, but leverage is dangerous. Please be careful. I only use two to one leverage. People go, what? But my brokers give me 500 to one. Of course they are. They want you to blow your brains out so they can, they're can. they on the other side of the trade. They can keep your money. They want you to have high leverage. They want to give you low margin, high leverage. One follows the other. Why? Because then a small move in the stock will cause you to get a margin call, panic, which you rightly should if you're over leveraged, and sell your position, which you rightly should if you're over leveraged. And guess what? They keep it. They're betting against you. They're on the other side of the trade. Okay, how do you get, le look, I'm not recommending leverage. We can talk about it later. It might be through a CFD, a spread bet. I'm not recommending it because leverage is higher risk. Risk warning, red alert, leverage is higher risk. I only